Thank you. Uh, okay, and I'm on the on the loudspeaker as well. So welcome to the last. No, there is one more after me, right? There's a keynote coming. So uh, it's 4 p.m. It's probably your heads are exploding with all the information today. So I will not help you with that, or I will help with exploding your heads. Uh, my name is Marek. I work uh, at Red Hat in the OpenShift team, and I will sh tell you something about uh, Docker, about containers, about OpenShift, Kubernetes, and we will do some walkthrough uh, what you may want to do what, and what you don't, may not want to do uh, with containers and other technologies. So I just need some information. That's why I asked to lower the lights, but I will move a bit here. Uh, who is an engineer like developers? That's the guys who build cool stuff. OK, nice. How many operations are the guys who run the cool stuff? And how many managers? Those are the guys who slow down the other two groups. <laughs> OK, almost no one. Good. So I have some basic ideas. So I'm speaking mostly to engineers and developers. So that's cool, because it's mostly about developer experience and how to, do, uh, how to work with that. Uh, so first, I will define a small problem that I found out recently. And I have been speaking to some of our customers, and I found out that they have a problem with very basic and very trivial stuff that has been here for years. First, inconsistent environments. That means it worked on my machine. It should work in production as well, right? But everybody knows that problem. And even though we are in the year 2017, right, 2017, uh, there are still companies struggling with this problem. So that's one of the things that we could tackle with containers. Uh, the other one is deployments done over SFTPS, depends on what you're trying to use, or just directly Git pulling and uh, check outing stuff. That's, Git is better than SFTPs. But still, it's a lot of uh, manual work that is error prone and could be a problematic. And uh, manual interactions are required to do, per, uh, to do deployments. Like I have to SSH into the machine, do git pull, do check out some specific commit, or something like that. So this is some of the problems that I have seen in the wild. Like uh, People are struggling with those. And in my talk, I would love to uh, somehow tackle these problems and show you that there might be a solution uh, that could help with those. So as you might expect, uh, based on, my, based on the, the, the number, name of the talk and what was on the slides, we are going to speak about containers. And containers pr pretty much uh, are the biggest password of today. Everybody speaks about them. Who heard about containers already? Who heard about containers two years ago? Yeah, almost no one. <laughs> Uh, it's like a technology that just came and it took the IT world uh, like a bomb and everybody now wants to do containers even though pretty much no one knows what they want to do and it's a, quite a mess, but everybody likes them. So what is a container? Just basic, uh, basic information to get us started. So on the left side, I have a container image, and on the right side, there is a virtual machine. So if you check the layers that are, that are on, the, on the picture, the virtual machine has more layers. That means uh, there is more stuff has to, be, has to run uh, to actually make something run, uh, something usable. So if you uh, want to use containers, it's much more lightweight because you don't have to virtualize the whole operating system. When you are in the virtualization land, you are making a virtual hardware and running uh, the operating system on it in a virtual machine, right? If you are in a container, you are virtualizing parts of the operating system, and then you are running application in that small part of the operating system. So it's much more lightweight, but there is one, one downside to that. You have only one kernel. So you cannot run Windows applications on Linux, and you cannot run Linux applications on Windows, because there, has to be, there is one kernel shared between all these containers. So that's just basic information to get us started. So what containers do, or what they are supposed to do, um, containers ship software. So they allow you to package something. It's a unit of packaging. And you can take it. You can send it to somebody. Somebody can download it uh, and spin up the application that's in that container. That, uh, that container should be self-contained. So it's pretty much the whole user land that the application needs for running, except the kernel, because the kernel is shared. And containers are supposed to be universal. Uh, which has not been super true until recently. There is open container initiative and some other standardization processes. So there is uh, work to being done to actually make containers built by one technology runnable using some other technology. And 
when we understand what containers are supposed to do for us, we can speak about Docker. Who have heard about Docker? Yeah, most of you. So Docker is pretty much the most famous technology for containers right now. And when somebody says, I want to run containers, they usually think about running Docker containers. There are some other implementations, like Rocket. There are FreeBSD jails, uh, Sun zones. Hrut is actually a container technology. It didn't allow like proper security constraints. It didn't allow resource, uh, resource isolation. But it was a container technology by itself. Very simple, but it was. So Docker is the container technology of today. Most people like it. Most people want to work with it. So what Docker does is, on one side, it defines a, a packaging format. So it says, OK, if you want to package a container, it will be this kind of uh, tar -GZ. It will be this meta information saved somewhere in this specific format. And this is described as a Docker container. This uh, description is actually being standardized as uh, the open container initiative. So the the standard is not something artificial created just uh, to somehow uh, describe any container. It is actually getting Docker and their specification and make it a standard so that other tools can use it as well. Uh, Docker is also a tool that allows you to build containers, uh, share them, and uh, get them. So that's something that we are going to use today. So one of the demos that I have is actually building a container and then uh, running the application that's in the container. But also, Docker Hub is a marketplace. So it's a place where you can share containers. So if you build a container, you can uh, take the container, push it into the Docker Hub, and somebody can discover it and pull it to his machine and spin it up. So it's a way how to distribute software as well. Yeah, OK. So uh, I'm already at my demo stage. Uh, so I will move over to uh, Atom. So I have some source code prepared here. I have a really, a really complex PHP application prepared for you. It's one file. I will make it bigger so you can read it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so because it's so complex, so you need, it has to be big so you can understand all the code that's there. But it actually makes everything simpler, because the way how you package a complex application is very much similar to how you, could, how you would package this small application. So if you try to package something, uh, something bigger, it may more, more, uh, take more time to actually take the time and uh, make it happen. But with a small application, it will be quick and easy, and the process is, pretty, is going to be very much the same. So if you do want to uh, package application uh, with a Docker container, what you have to do is to write a Docker file. And I apologize for my weird uh, moving of my mouse, because my trackpad and my keyboard died on, on the laptop. So I bought myself a, a wireless keyboard yesterday. So I'm using a keyboard and a mouse, because the, the laptop is not really functioning. So if you see weird movements, it's, uh, it's OK. So what, does, what this does is, OK, let's, let's build a container. Uh, that means the, from PHP, uh, because what Docker is, uh, has designed is hierarchy of different layers of containers. And you can say, from PHP, and then there is a version. And it says, take the PHP container that's already on Docker Hub. And this Docker container will be the base. And then all the other commands that will be below it will take this base image and somehow extend it. Right? So somebody had done all the hard work for us to already build the, or like install Apache, configure Apache, install PHP, link these things together. This has already been done. So from PHP, just uh, gives me 7.1 uh, PHP and Apache running in the container. What all I have to do is take my source code and copy, copy it into that var, uh, www HTML uh, directory. And then uh, when the container is committed, I will get something that I can distribute, I can run, my application is there, runnable. So how, about, how do I build a container? Uh, it's a very simple command. Uh, so uh, docker build dash t says name the container php uk and take uh, the docker file in the current directory as the source. Right? So uh, I'm going to copy paste this into my console. And we are going to build a container. So first, what we are doing is, oh, let me make it slightly bigger. Can you read it? Hands up. Can you read it? No, not in the back. So 
Now, yeah, cool. Uh, so what we said, uh, Docker built a container using this Docker file. So from PHP, it uh, used the container with, with each SHA was uh, this, uh, this number. So I, because I already did uh, the time-consuming part of downloading all the layers on my machine, so it is using uh, the, the layers from my cache on my machine, so it was pretty fast. And the next step, which was second and last, was take the source code in the SRH directory and put it into the container. So my container was built, uh, and the only thing that I now got to do is to start something, all right? So the, I, when I want to run a container, I do docker run, uh, dash t, dash i, so I want, to have, I want to have stdi connected with the container and my shell, and I want a tti for that, uh, for that container, and dash p says that uh, a port 8080 on my machine will be mapped to an 80, 80 port in the container. And PHP UK is the name of the container which we named in the previous step. So taking this in here, spinning up a container, you see that Apache has been started. There is some problem with host names as usual. And Apache is running in the foreground, which is OK. Uh, let's go back here. Localhost and 8080. Ooh, 8080. Right, and I have PHP uh, info page on my uh, on my screen. So what I did is I took my uh, my simple PHP application, I put it into the container. I can I can run it uh, now. If I have something more complex like WordPress, Drupal, uh, whatever, I. But I will package the application exactly the same way. The only thing is I will need to link it with some uh, database, with something else that's, uh, uh, that's running next to it. But that's a configuration problem. That's not like how you package the application. That's more like how you start the application later. So our application was running. So that's how you do uh, this kind of stuff with, uh, uh, with Docker. But there are still some problems with that, right? So for every application, I need to write a Docker file because the Docker file def defines how I put my source code into the, uh, into the container. So even though uh, in, in, in the most simplest cases, I would, need, I would just copy paste that, that, uh, that file that I had before, the Docker file, into all my, my projects, I still have to have the Docker files there. And the other thing is engineers have to understand how Docker, uh, how Docker works and need to write the Docker file. Uh, my pro what I don't like about it also is that I have to put all, if I want to do something more complex, I would need to put run commands and do some shell scripting in the Docker file, which is not very convenient. And the last and biggest problem is that my builds, the builds of the containers are being done on, a, on the local machine, on my machine right here. This is problematic mostly if you are a startup, very like small startup where the, where the uh, engineers and uh, the operations have a fluid uh, set of uh, functions and they just move from one uh, role to the other. That's quite fine, but once you get a bigger company and you find out that there is a specific division between I am supposed to develop stuff and I'm supposed to run stuff, so I'm developer or an operations person. Uh, building uh, containers on local machines of the engineers or developers is quite problematic because what happens if uh, the operations person takes the, takes the Docker container, uh, it's in production, container is running, everything's fine, and three days into, into that, the container starts failing. And there is a problem that is only, being fi is, is only fixable by changing the Docker file or rebuilding the container. So the operations person has to go back to the engineer and say, hey, there is a problem. You need, I need you to fix it. And he says, sorry, I have a deadline. I cannot do it right now, next week. But my production is failing. Yeah, not my problem. And this can be a problematic. So uh, it is uh, beneficial if the, yes, it's cool if engineers write the Docker files, and, but it's not really cool if they build Docker files and the operations people only rely on the binary blobs that are produced by the engineers. This can be problematic. So uh, there is a tool called source to image uh, that is trying to mitigate some of those problems. Not all of them, but some of those. Uh, so, first, it understands the technology that it's trying to build. So, the, the basic idea is, let's create a container that is capable of building other containers. I will take, I will, somebody who understands how to build stuff, how to do operations, will create a container uh, with all the dependencies, with everything, and the 
developer only needs to point this Docker container on some specific source code, and it will build container pre-configured by the operations, and take, will, will take the source code in and will create a new container that's runnable. Pretty much what we did in the previous one, but without doing the Docker file stuff. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much what I have in my bullet points. So let's move to small demo. Uh, back to back here. So S2I. Now my application is still very complex, still extremely complex application. And when I go to build, there is one command that I can do. So source to image build using the source code in uh, the directory as RC and using the image that, that uses uh, PHP 7.0 on CentOS 7 and create a new container named PHP UK. Well, let's do something first. Docker RMI PHP UK. Uh, so I have, I have cleaned the, uh, the container that we created in the first step, so you will trust me that I actually built a new container. So we are in the S2I. So I already have the, the CentOS PHP 7.0 CentOS 7 cached, so there was nothing to download. It was quite fast. So only thing I need to do is install the application source because I, don't, I have no composer file. I am not pulling any dependencies or anything like that. It, it's just putting the source code there, exactly as we did in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, example. So when I move back to uh, start, I will spin it up. Do you see the difference between this command, this command and the one that we had in the previous example? The port, yeah. So that's also one of the problems that uh, some of the Docker containers have, mostly those that are in Docker Hub. Uh, when you Spin, when, when we built the previous one, uh, the effective user running in the container was root. And I will ask those uh, operations people who I have in the audience, who would run your application as root on your machine in production? OK, no hands. Uh, so uh, what we do is we actually, whenever we uh, package a container and using the STI, S2I tool, uh, we don't run the container as root. You don't have to be a root to actually run the container. So you cannot bind to port 80, as it was possible in the previous container. Uh, but it's bound to 8080 because it is running as some specific user. So that's one of the, one of the security implications that uh, S2I also brings to you. OK. Spin it up. Pretty much the same output as in the previous case. Refresh the page. And it's there. There is uh, more things in the, there are more dependencies in the, for the ini file, and there is a different version, so we have built a new container. But this time, no Docker file was involved, and somebody who, who was okay, or who was willing, who was knowledgeable to build the container, he built container for me, and I just used his container with all his knowledge to build, to put my source code in there and build the application. So let's go back to my presentation. And small recap. So with Docker, it's a packaging format. format. Uh, it's, uh, it it's, it's, it's a nice tool to manage containers on single machine. And you can use it to uh, go to registry or like marketplace. S2I builds on top of Docker. Uh, it allows you to build containers from source code. And uh, your source code doesn't have to be aware of the Docker. There is no need for Docker file. So with these things, uh, we might have fixed some of the problems, right? So in, for the inconsistent environments, even though uh, my development is still happening on my machine, I can package, uh, the, I can package the, the application in the container. So the, the environment the application is running in is, can be the same as in the, in, the, in the production. Because if it's built using the, from the same image, or if it's built using the same image in S2I example, uh, I have the same environment uh, for, for my application. And I don't have to do uh, deployments over SFTPS or uh, JIT, uh, Git uh, because uh, I can push uh, my container and the container can be deployed. There is still the problem that the containers are uh, 
built on my machine, so the operations people don't have access to my, uh, my Docker files. And uh, the manual inter interactions are still required because I have to SSH into my machine, Docker pool uh, the container, or get it there somehow, and then spin it up. So uh, once you try to solving the problem of the manual, manual uh, interactions, you will actually find out that it, it is solved by most of the tools that allow running containers uh, on, uh, on a scale, not on a single machine. And do you remember uh, the, the shortcut PAS, P-A-S? Who does? OK. So it was very popular uh, a few years back. Uh, the popularity is slightly, uh, slightly going down. So it was on, on one side you had an engineer, uh, there is some black box, and then you had an running application. So it, usually it was like that, you do uh, git, uh, git commit, git push, uh, the tool does some, some, some work for me, and then I have my application running. So we had a tool like that called OpenShift, uh, which we extended and we completely rewrote, and we came up with what we call OpenShift V3. Uh, it's, a, it's a platform for running and building containers. It leverages Docker and Kubernetes. Do you know Kubernetes? Okay, Kubernetes uh, is a project started by Google. Google has been using containers since like 2004. Everything that runs in Google infrastructure has to be in a container. And how big is Google infrastructure? Big. Uh, nobody knows really, but I probably it's 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 very big. So we have been running uh, containers on this Google scale, and then they started a project called Kubernetes, and then where they are open sourcing the know-how of running containers for 10 years on this Google scale. So it, we are basing on that, and we are also using many other open source projects. We are also op completely open source, so you can go github.com/openshift/origin. You can get the source code. Uh, so Origin is the open source project. We have OpenShift Container Platform, which is a product that we uh, sell support for. And then we have Online, which is a service that uh, you can run on. And we are leveraging the S2I tool. So it, we, it's, it's possible to use the, the platform to build containers and then deploy them, and as, as well as deploying containers from, uh, from Docker Hub. Uh, we try to make the platform much more, uh, much more uh, versatile then uh, it was with the PAAS concept. So we, we call it actually container orchestration platform, which is very important for the microservices way of doing stuff, because it doesn't matter if it's HTTP or, uh, so PA, PAAS was mostly developed for running PHP, uh, HTTP applications, but container platforms are usually uh, okay to run whatever is TCP based or UDP based. We put a lot of security constraints around the stuff, so if your container is compromised and the, the attacker gets out of the container, we have a Linux policies around those containers. So even though he gets out of the container, he still is isolated by the SC Linux. And you can allocate uh, like specify quota and, and uh, how, how much resources uh, users can use. So how difficult is it is to use the platform? So I can OC is the, is the client tool, so you can do OC, new app, uh, then I say what technology I want to use as the source to I, so PHP, and then I point at some, uh, at some GitHub repository, so it will create all the, all the stuff in the background that needs to be there uh, to make an application running. It will pull the code, it will build the code, build the container, deploy the container. I can also do it like uh, MySQL, so it will just look into Docker Hub and it will pull the container and deploy MySQL for using the container pulled from Docker Hub, or you can pull for whatever uh, repository or registry you want to. Uh, if you have something already internal, you can use that as well. If you wanna try some, I will do some demos, but uh, if you wanna do something like that in, uh, on your own machine or do it at home, we have project called Minishift, which allows you to spin up uh, OpenShift locally. So you do Minishift start, it will download boot to Docker ISO, uh, it will download the OC client tool in there, and then it will run uh, OC cluster up, which spins up the cluster in the VM. So you, half? Okay. Uh, spins up uh, OpenShift in the VM, so everything's contained in this virtual machine, and you can access it and do whatever you want. Uh, and it's extremely simple. So let's do some demos. And so I'm going to close this page. And I will start with, uh, with my 
web console. So when you spin up OpenShift, it looks something like that. Uh, you can add something to your project. Uh, so project is like a namespace where things are located. So I can choose PHP. We have a very, I have a very old version right here, 5.6, but that's quite fine for the, for the example. So let's select it. I can name, name my application to demo, uh, demo in web console or something like that. I take my source code from HTTPS, from GitHub. It's still the same complex application as we had before. Uh, let's click it. The Wi-Fi is not working, is it? Is it loading? Yeah, but it's very slow. Hmm. Well, let's hope it will work here. So, create, back to overview. So what happened is, there is no deployment yet, uh, it's not very really readable on the screen. Is it better now? What? Yeah, I don't have internet. Okay, now I have internet. So, okay, my build failed. So there was a build. So it was trying to clone my repository and uh, the build failed. So that can happen. So I just, I can start the build again. So new build is running. You can see the log. So, yeah. So right now I have pulled the source code. I, am, I was installing the, uh, the application source into the, uh, into the container. So that was the same step as, uh, as it did before. And then I am pushing into the uh, local registry. So when I get back to my overview page, you can see that I have one container running already. My application is available on this DNS. Yeah, so it's older, older PHP, but pretty much the same workflow would be for 7.1, 7.0, or whatever. And I can check my, my container running somewhere here. So I can see the logs. So this is the same logs as I saw before. And I can go to terminal. I can see that my application is running, right? So I didn't have to do anything on my laptop. What I, what I would have to do with this workflow is uh, work, on my, my, work on my things, and when I'm ready, git commit, git push to some git, GitHub repo, or GitLab repo, or whatever I'm using in your, in your company. And you can, you can configure webhooks to actually trigger uh, the build in the platform. So whenever you git push, uh, the, the container is going to be built, and is going to be deployed. So the engineer who is working on something, he doesn't have to at all understand how Docker works, how container works. For him, it's like add to project, select, select the PHP version, this is my source code, configure my GitHub with the webhooks, and whenever I git push, I will see the current version of my application running in the platform. So that's one of the ways. So that's okay. But not everybody wants to uh, push into Git repos. Not everybody wants to use uh, use GitHub or GitLab. So you can also do pretty much the same thing using source code uh, in your, in your uh, command line. So again, I have some scripts prepared over here. So when I am in, uh, in here, I have a source code. Again, the same my extreme complex application. So this time, I will do similar things as I did before uh, in the web console, but I will do it uh, from, the, from the command line, and I will use uh, the source code that's in the source directory. So first, I will create a new application using the source code and name it PHP UK. So that's this. And when I switch back to my web console, see it very nicely, you see that uh, my, fail, my, my build failed right now, that's expected, but I created all the uh, things required around it to actually make it happen. 
Uh, I can also create the, I didn't create the DNS this time, so I can create it manually, so okay, I want to expose my application using some DNS. Let's go back, so now I have a DNS. Not, nothing's running there yet, but what I have to do is I need to start a build and stream my source code from the source directory into, uh, into the build container. So I will start a new build, and I will use the source directory to actually make it happen. So uh, it's packaging my, uh, my source, uh, streaming it into the platform, then extracting it into the container, and the build will do pretty much the same thing as it did before, but instead of cloning from some Git repo, I just streamed in uh, my, uh, my source code, and then I committed a new container. So when I refresh my page, uh, I can see that I have my application running already. So when I switch back to my presentation, so did I manage to solve something uh, during my talk? So uh, I, the inconsistent environments, I would say it's pretty much solved because whenever you take your, your source code and you put it into the Docker, uh, Docker container, this Docker container can be moved from one stage to the other. So if, whatever tool or whatever workflow you are going to use, you can solve this inconsistent environments problem using uh, Docker containers. So that's okay. So deployments are done over F, uh, FTP or Git. This can be solved because uh, I can Docker push my containers or I can build from source code somewhere else, so that's okay. Manual interactions are required, so it's solved because if I have, some, if I, if I have tool like OpenShift, I can trigger the builds and deployments using webhooks or something whenever I get pushed, whenever I have new source code. So that's pretty much solved. Uh, high availability of, of containers, uh, that's pretty much easy. And I can show you that. So if I go down to my console, OC get pods. This is the containers I am running at this moment. So there is one that should be running. This one, uh, go back to the console, back over here, get new overview. Come on. So, PHP UK, it's this container. So, what I can do, OC, delete, port. So, I'm going to kill the container. This is like container failed. I'm simulating container failure. So, what's going to happen is the platform will detect that the container failed and it will automatically create new container that is going to be deployed. Because I already have the image of the application in the container in the platform, it's just a matter of pulling the image if it's not already cached on the node and then just spinning up the container. So it's very fast and you have pretty much, and you have pretty much high availability for, the, for your application. The same goes for scaling, you can scale up uh, and scale down the containers. That's a nice benefit of using such, something like that, something like OpenShift. Ooh, I lost my full screen, okay. So the only problem that I haven't solved is development on local machines, which I don't consider a problem, even though some people would love to code in web interface or using some web IDE, I still consider developing on my own machine much more productive, so I am not trying to solve this problem right now. So thank you for uh, being here, and I have, if you have any questions, I am super happy to answer them. And I will just move out of the light so I see uh, on the person who is going to ask. No questions? Okay. Hi. Uh, hey. Thank you for the talk. Um, one question. That application you just showed where you run all this, where you had the problem with um, GitHub, um, is that running locally or is that available online or where is that running? Uh, what do you mean? Can you repeat the question? My application, the source code you mean? No, not the source code. You showed, um, uh, you run the commands on your command line to get the PHP UK container built in your web frame, in your web front end. Yes. Um, where's that application, that web front end running? Because that looked to me like a local installation or is that? Yes, yes. So okay. uh, what I did before I, uh, I came here because I wanted to have the things uh, ready, I used this Minishift tool to actually, I did Minishift start, so I spinned up OpenShift running on my machine, so it was running in a virtual box on that laptop. 
and I was using the zip IO, if you have seen it, uh, so I can translate the IP address of the container into DNS. Uh, so it was running everything on my laptop, and when I clean it up, uh, it will be gone, uh, of course. And the problem was that if, you, if I run it here on my laptop, I have to rely on the Wi-Fi of the, of the connection. That was the problem. Thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, Thank you. I've never seen S2i before. It looks really interesting. How can you handle parameterization or configuration um, through S2i? Because we saw you loading source code mm -hmm. for an application into the container with that tool. Um, what about loading configuration for your application or for your environment and stuff like that? Uh, you mean build time configuration or runtime configuration? Either, both. <laughs> So there are two, like, uh, S2i is only trying to solve the build time uh, problem, right? So S2i itself can take environment variables, can take some properties file that define some information that's being then pushed into the container. You can also map a specific directory from your machine into the container, so you can read something from well-known path or something like that. Uh, or I would probably say that the easiest one is to set some environment variables and def like build, uh, change the build based on that. Uh, the container that is doing the build is essentially a simple Docker container that you install all the dependencies in, and you create generally two scripts. Assemble, that's the build process, and run, which is the uh, how to start the application. And this is, this is going to be the entry point of the container that's being committed after the build. Right? Uh, so for the build process, this is that. Uh, for uh, the runtime configuration, it depends on where you're going to run. If you're going to run in something like OpenShift, you can use environment variables. We have config maps, which allows you to mount a, a file into the container. Uh, you can have secrets, which is encrypted information. You know, there are several ways. Uh, if you're going to run like Docker, just Docker, uh, environment variables, and in the latest release, they have some kind of secrets or something like that. So it depends on what technology you want to use. Uh, but for source to I, uh, generally, either environment variables or mounting some configuration directory into the container. Hi. Um, so sorry. Um, really good talk. Um, my question may be based in complete ignorance, so I, I apologize before I ask it. Um, but one thing I didn't really understand was, so if you're deploying an application like, say, WordPress to Docker, I don't know whether people would bother, but if they are, um, you would have a files permissions issue, as in not all your directories, not all your files require the same user permissions and user ownership. How do you deal with that issue in Docker, or how do you config that to say, for instance, like the uploads folder needs read-write versus everything else that doesn't? Um, well, it depends. Uh, in our case, uh, when you spin up a container in the platform, it always runs as some uh, randomly generated user ID because that mitigates some of the known actor attacks, uh, vector, attack vectors on the containers. And the, the group is root. So what we do is we set uh, read-write to group on the, con on the files that are generated by the container. So there is a, com call, there is a command called fix permissions, which does that. Uh, it's part of the tooling. Uh, so whenever you commit the container, uh, it will allow the root group to actually write into those files that are part of the application itself, not to the whole image. Uh, and that helps you with the file permissions. But there is more, uh, well, depends on what you want to do. Like, if you're running WordPress or Drupal, those uh, tools usually like to write to file system. So if you are in a container, if you are trying to do something that's more scalable, you need a scalable file system as well. So uh, that's, again, one of the features that we have is you, it allows you to uh, mount that dynamically some uh, uh, either distributed file system or normal file system into the container. So when your container restarts, the data is still there. And so but because by default, containers are ephemeral. When you, when you go into the con running container, you change something, uh, and then you stop the container. All this data is lost, generally. That's how you should approach containers. Uh, do you have time? I, I was just going to suggest, um, does it support, does your tools support UID mapping? Sorry? UID mapping. What do you mean? 
So mapping UIDs uh, from inside the container can run as zero root, uh, and then you can map that to a normal user ID outside, and there's some parameters in Docker to do that. You could do that, but the problem is if you run the container as a root, which is by default, you allowing somebody to get out of the container. If it gets out of the container, you can get into the... But because user namespaces are not yet there in Docker, that's something that's being worked on. So once we get user namespaces, yes, it will be much, much, much easier. But we are getting into technical details, <laughs> which are probably too weird. Uh, so if you... Let's discuss this after the, after the talk, so I, I can still handle some few more questions. Would it be okay? 15 minutes. Still. Yeah. yeah. But I saw like five hands, so. <laughs> Are there any um, platforms as a service where we can throw a couple of, uh, you know, two, three containers up there and see it running live? I, I understand the mini shift is, you know, good for your machine, but I want to be able to test stuff with a live machine, with a live web server and live services, Redis, MySQL, um, so that other people can bang on it as well. Yeah, so I have here account on developer preview of OpenShift as a service uh, for general use cases. So I am running two uh, simple applications over here. But essentially what I can do exactly the same way is uh, deploy, deploy, select uh, PHP. Do I have it already here? No. Take this, yes, please. Go, go, create, continue to overview. So right now I am, what did I do? Why is my build not happening? Builds, builds, PHP, there are no builds. Interesting, start build, builds happening. Okay, so right now I am using uh, OpenShift as a service. Uh, that's all. If you go to openshift.com, you can sign up for the service. Uh, it's a developer preview, so it's the account like right now lasts uh, for one month, but we will be extending it hopefully very soon. And uh, you can do pretty much exactly the same what I did on my machine. You can do there. Uh, OpenShift itself can uh, run on any infrastructure. So if you spin it up on GCE, on AWS, your own bare metal, uh, you can do it. Uh, it's open source, so if you are okay to running it yourself, uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, if you want us to help you with that, there is a product that we are, where we uh, help you as a support. So there are different ways how to do it. Yes, I, I didn't try to do cluster on DigitalOcean. Uh, I am using a single VM cluster on Linode. Linode is similar to DigitalOcean, but has double the memory than for the same price. Uh, but technically, it's the same. Uh, so the, sing, the, the small problem is that uh, I am not sure what's their network configuration. So because for every single project, we create a virtual network that isolates the communication inside that project. So different projects cannot see each other's communication, which is one of the security aspects. And I'm not sure what will, what's going to happen if you put this on the DigitalOcean uh, private networks. It may not work. I'm not sure. But definitely what will work is, and one of my colleagues is doing it on DigitalOcean, and I am doing it on uh, on the Linode, spin up one node cluster. That works direct, just fine. It works fine on GCE as a cluster on AWS and Azure. That's tested as a cluster, multi-machine. I couldn't hear right now, so can you repeat it? That, that doesn't get you a half a dozen you know, containers across a, that you need to run across more than one machine. Yeah, if you, if you want to get a high availability, you need to have it on multiple machines. Uh, yeah, and not just high availability, but you know, more than one machine could handle. Yeah, so, yeah, but you still can scale up. Uh, if you cannot scale horizontally, you can scale vertically on DigitalOcean, right? It's not the best approach, but still solves problem for if you don't have resources to run something like GCE or AWS. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just 
discuss later. Okay, just <laughs> if you have follow-up questions, don't worry, come here and we can discuss that. Okay, so the build finished uh, and the application should be running if my internet is going to work this time. I am resolving hosts, so DNS seems to be failing. Stuck on resolving host. Okay, any more questions? No more questions. So again, I will switch back to my slides and say thank you. Uh, you were a great audience. Uh, it was And I have books here, so this is OpenShift for Developers book. Uh, it walks you through deploying applications, spinning up OpenShift on your own machine as well. Uh, this time not, not using Minishift, but using Vagrant. Uh, if you are interested, they are here. If I run out of them, I still have a box down, so there is still more uh, books. So come here and take one if you want. <laughs>